We've learned that atoms decay. decay. They decay into other uh, uh, particles through the process of alpha radiation, beta radiation, uh, and other processes we just haven't even gotten into. So, such as a positron emission or absorption, electron absorption. There are other ways to do it. But what triggers this? Well, it's due to stability, the stability of each isotope, uh, which varies. And the only thing we really can see is that the decay rate, the way they decay, even though the rate's different for different atoms and different isotopes, the way they decay is the same all the time. It makes it easy to measure. We're, generally, we talk about linear decay rates. You know, if something's, if something's, uh, if it takes, if something is half gone after a day, then it's probably going to be all gone in two days. It happens linearly. Well, this doesn't happen with radioactive decay and many other processes in nature. I've got a number of particles on this axis, and I've got time on this axis, and the particles do not decay as a straight line. They do this. It's called an exponential decay. And this is how it works. If I start off with at n equals zero, I mean time zero, I start off with n sub o, my initial number. Let's say n sub o is equal to initial number of particles over time. I'm going to lose them, but it's going to disappear more rapidly at first than later. So let's say uh, that's oh, half of them are gone. Right there. Here's my initial number divided by two. At some time, this time right there, half the particles have decayed. I'm going to call this T sub one half. The one half is not really a number, it's just a name. T to the one half is something you've heard of, it's called the half life. It's the time it takes for half of the material to decay. Now, watch what happens next. Here I'm at n sub over two. Let me cut it in half again. Now I've got n sub o over 4, but notice that it really, I didn't draw this quite right. It takes the same amount of time. And if I dump it in half again, the same amount of time transpires. So for each half-life, I lose half of what I started with. That's what an exponential curve does. So if I started off with 20 at the end of, uh, and I ended up with 10 in one day, the next day I'd wind up with 5, and the next day I'd wind up with 2 and a half, and the next day 1 and a quarter. So I keep dropping by half instead of in a linear progression. Now the way it works is, let's see, the number of atoms that I have, I should write that down, the number of particles, n equals number of particles at any time. And uh, T is the elapsed time. So how does this work? Um, number of particles divided by the original particle, the fraction of particles that I have left, well, after the first half-life, it's one-half. After the second half-life, it's one-fourth, one-eighth. So I keep multiplying this by one-half. So it's n. n's the number of half-lives. Maybe I shouldn't use that. Maybe I should use this. This is a fraction. The time divided by the half-lives is the number of half-lives. If I have, at, one, at the end of one half-life, the time would be t one-half, and that would be one. At the end of two half-lives, it would be two t to the one. And t, two half-lives divided by half-life is two. So this tells me what it is, not just when I have after one or two or three half-lives. This will tell me what it is when the time is Two and a half half lives, or 2.6318 half lives. So I can get an exact solution using this. So if I know that 
the half-life of a material, and I know the time that it's been sitting there, I can determine the fraction of the original material that will be left. So I could solve for either the amount of material that's left, and if I had one of these, I could solve for the other. Now, I don't know how to solve for the time here. And mostly when you talk about radioactive dating, for example, people are always trying to figure out, you know, what, how old something is, what's the time. To do that, we need to take the log of both sides. 